Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer before we get into our study tonight. Father God, we do uh, humbly and faithfully come before you this evening, Lord, and, and ask that you would show us everything that you want us to know from tonight's study. Father, that you would make it crystal clear to us that it would be none of me, Father, and all of you. Father, you truly are, as we just sung, so incredibly faithful. Your love stretches beyond anything we could imagine. To your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, welcome again. If you guys have your Bibles this evening with you, and I hope you do, turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. And in a minute, we're going to be picking up where we left off last week as we get into chapter 4. So as has been mentioned a couple of times in our study already, if you've been with us this time through 1 John, well, we see a back and forth nature throughout the book. So John will start to expound on a topic, will explain a little bit about it, go to another topic, and then he'll often go back to that original topic. What's really interesting about the book of John is that he starts to tie all this stuff together and build on those previous points. So as we're thinking about that and we're thinking about where we've left off and a little bit of review before we go further, I think it's helpful for us to remind ourselves of John's objective for writing this particular book to the church. And this is another one of those examples of things that we've seen continue to build. So in the first couple of chapters, specifically the first chapter, well, we were introduced very clearly to one of the reasons why he's writing this. Well, then the next chapter, we got another reason as to why. And as we continue to go through this, we, he keeps building on that, and we understand further why. So a couple of things that he's told us so far. So in that first chapter, we saw one of the reasons that he's writing this is that our joy may be full. And we saw that last chapter as well. He kind of um, circled back to that. Now, a second thing that he tells us very clearly, the reason for writing this particular book is that we would know. We spent a lot of time talking about what it meant to know, and that's that Greek word, um, gnosko, you know, talking about that experiential aspect of knowledge. Well, he told us another reason, too. I believe it was in the next chapter, but he said specifically that you would not sin. So one of the reasons he's writing these things and reminding the church of these things is so we wouldn't sin. And we talked about what that meant and that the person that's abiding in him can't sin. And that's an amazing promise of God. But it's a simple aspect from the perspective that that's how it works. Christ doesn't sin. If you're in Christ, therefore you're like him from a positional perspective. Therefore, you have that same power or ability over sin. Well, last chapter, we got another one, that we would not be ashamed at his coming, so that when he does come, well, we would be prepared. We'd be confident, I believe is the word he specifically used. So that's a couple of the reasons that he's writing this letter. We're going to see that expounded on a little bit more this evening. Now, over the last two chapters specifically, well, John has been spending a lot of those chapters continuing to build on what it means to truly abide and what abiding fellowship with our Lord looks like with an emphasis on knowing him from that experiential aspect. Now, on that foundation, specifically, last week, or in last week's study, well, John added another aspect to our ability to know. And how do we know that we know that we are in him? Well, by the outworking of our love, specifically towards other people. We can know that we're of him by our love. So if you got your Bibles open to chapter 4, look back to chapter 3 specifically. Look at verse 18. This is where he starts to kind of really express this, but he says, my little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and truth. That's a principle that you can apply beyond just simply loving. It could be abiding. It could be trusting in the Lord. 
In other words, what he's saying is, don't just simply do this with lip service, but you need to have your actions. They need to be built on truth, and they need to, you need to do something from that perspective. But look what he says here in verse 19 specifically. And by this we know, that's that experiential knowledge, that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. So what he's saying there is one of the reasons that we know that we are of him and that we are of the truth well, is because of the outworking of our love that he said. Let us not love in word or in tongue, but indeed in truth. So that's another way that we know that we know that we're of him is when we are loving like he is. Now, what is the result of that or what do we do as a result of that? Well, we get that in verses 23 and 24, which kind of set the basis or the groundwork for where we go tonight. In verse 23, he says, and this is his commandment. So we're looking at, well, what do we do now with that information? Well, John tells us that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. Okay, we, we need to believe. But then in addition, and love one another as he gave us commandment. So with this knowledge, this experiential knowledge he was talking about, now we have a commandment, and we know this is the greatest commandment, right, that Jesus specifically said. Well, that commandment is that now you need to love one another like Christ loved you. Well, look where he goes here in verse 24. He says, now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he speaking of Jesus in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So notice where he goes next with this and the connection back to the how this works. It's not by your own efforts. If you're trying to do this by your own efforts, you're going to fail. That's the only way it can work, right? No, the key aspect to this is by the spirit whom he has given us, as we just read there in verse 24. So I want to go back, and I know we've looked at this previously a couple of weeks ago, but turn back to the book of John, chapter 16, and I want to look at a few more aspects of what or how the Holy Spirit's working, because it's going to be helpful for tonight's study. And if if you've gone through the book of 1 John before, or maybe even in your studies this time, it's amazing. It's almost like mind-blowing how much this parallels the book of John. In my mind, there's no doubt as to who wrote this book. I mean, it's all inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? But you see the connections, and it's like it's a shorter version of the book of John. He brings, he builds on all the points. So go back to John chapter 16. We're going to pick it up in verse 5. And before I forget to remind you this, put a marker here because we'll be back a little bit later for something else. But specifically picking it up here in verse 5, and we're looking for the ministry or the role of the Holy Spirit. That's why we're here. Verse 5 says, But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? Now this is Jesus talking to his disciples, right? And he's going to tell them about the promise of the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 6, But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. And we just, we saw that back in 1 John about the emphasis of the truth and the connection to the Spirit. He's going to build on this very clearly here in a minute. It is to your advantage. Now, this is Jesus speaking to them that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. So as wonderful as it was, and I'm not diminishing that in the least bit, when Jesus was here in the flesh before them, he's saying, hey, when the Helper comes, it's needful that he comes to you. Well, we know why, because the Spirit's going to be in us now. But he says, the Helper will not come to you, but if I depart... I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. So that's the first thing we see that the Spirit is going to do. 
He's going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Then he says in verse 9, of sin, because they do not believe me, of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, look at what he is called. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of of truth has come. He will guide you into all truth for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Look at the ultimate role of the Holy Spirit. He will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. I'll include verse 15 here. All things that the father has are mine. Therefore I said, that he will take of mine and declare it to you. So how does, or how do we know that he abides in us? By the spirit he has given us, like we just read here in John 16. Now, why I bring this up again is because what we're going to see is, or what we have seen is very clearly three distinct times in the book of 1 John, this is referenced as to how this works is by the Spirit whom he has given us. And I want to emphasize that is how this works. So with that, if you want to turn back here to the 1 John, the end, again, verse 24, we'll move on to chapter 4 here. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. Chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So here in verse 1, now Paul is transitioning. He's building on the subject of the Holy Spirit, but now he's going to talk about something else that's connected to that. He's saying, beloved, don't believe every spirit. So immediately we get this idea of every spirit, or that there are multiple spirits, both good and evil, as he's going to explain here in a few minutes, righteous and unrighteous. He referenced this vaguely back in the last chapter when he was talking about what was going on with Cain and Abel and their sacrifice. Hey, there was a good sacrifice and there was a bad sacrifice. There was two parties working there, as we saw. Now, he says, knowing this, we are told very specifically to do something with that information. We're told to test the spirits, to determine whether they are of God or not of God. So if, as we think about this a little bit, so like, wait a minute now. So there are other spirits working as well. Now he was just talking about the Holy Spirit. Well, absolutely, there are other spirits. This is a point too that I think a lot of Christians miss. They, they don't consider it maybe, or they don't think of it in this fashion that, you know, there are other spirits working. Therefore, not everything we may hear or the leadings we may have are of the Lord. In other words, there's another team out there that's working as well. Now, as we think about that other team, and you're like, maybe your mind's already going there. Think about some of the things that the Bible or Scripture specifically tells us regarding the devil himself. As we're thinking about these other spirits, right? Well, what are some of the names that Satan or the devil has? Well, he's the father of lies is one that came to mind. What about the great deceiver? A masquerader of the light. Their goal here is to deceive and to be deceptive. So when we're told to test the spirits, there are false spirits out there that are telling you something that are in harmony with what Satan's working is, to deceive, to lie, to masquerade, or to to act as if they were something good, but yet there's something bad. So what are we to do with that information? Well, this particular passage here, John tells us very specifically what we're to do with that. We're to test the spirits, 
in a parallel kind of a passage, it's a little bit shorter, but in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, he reminds us that we are to test all things. Well, this is another aspect of that. So when we're hearing something, and we believe that we have a leading, whatever that may be, well, as we see here in 1 Thessalonians, and as we see in 1 John, our response to that needs to be, we need to test it to see whether or not it's of God. Now, the question to ask ourselves is, well, why? Why do we need to test these things? Well, he actually tells us specifically here in this verse, he says that, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. So we know this. This isn't the first time he's told us this, actually. He told us this back in chapter 2, that these the antichrists have gone out. But there are other people out there that are preaching something that is not truth and not of God. That's what he's saying. That's the why aspect. So the question then becomes, well, if there are other spirits potentially influencing us, as we just read here, because he said test the spirits, well, how do we know what we're hearing is of God or is of a false spirit? Somebody working to deceive us. Well, verse 2 explains it to us. He says, by this you know the spirit of God. And it's got a colon there. It says, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. So we get the answer to our question, or one of the answers to our question. He says, by this you know that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, well, that is a spirit that you can listen to. That is a spirit that is of God. In other words, one that confesses a couple of things. One that Jesus is the Son of God. That's what we see right there in that verse. Well, that secondly, that he came in the flesh. In other words, not meaning that he was sinful, that's not the aspect of flesh we're talking about here, but that he was also a man. So in other words, fully God and fully human. That's what the Spirit of God will confess to you. In other words, uh, probably a more popular way of saying this would be that it's one that doesn't deny the incarnation of Jesus. So why do we bring this up? Why would, is there people that believe that? Well, absolutely. I mean, one of the, the, the groups that came to mind as the Lord was um, studying with me on this or preparing me for this was Jehovah Witnesses, for example, would be one example of this and not just particularly picking on them, but they believe that Jesus is a God. They don't believe he is the God. If you look for instance at what they, um, how they read and what their Bibles, which is similar, but has some differences in John, it says in the beginning was the word. Their version of it says, and the word was a God, not the God or not God specifically. That's one example of denying that Jesus is God. Now, as we think about this, so, okay, so we, we, we're hearing something on a subject, and how do we tell whether or not this is of God or this is of another spirit? Well, here we're told specifically that if, if as we said here, by this you know the Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses, that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God. Well, that's one aspect of this, but there's some other things too that we need to consider. So this is not the only test for knowing whether it's of God. It's one of the tests. Think about this, for example, when Jesus tempted, or Jesus tempted, excuse me, when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, I believe he believed that God was in the flesh at that point. He specifically used scripture. So we see that there's other things that we need to look at. We need to know specifically when we're hearing whether or not it's from God. So the first thing that you could write down if you're taking notes, well, does what we're hearing align with the word of God? 
does what we're hearing align with the word of God? Well, we have some very clear scriptures that talk about this. So if you're still in the book of John, or if you have that ribbon in the book of John, turn over to the 17th chapter, specifically. Look at what it says regarding the word of God. We're going to jump in here, John 17, verse 7, excuse me. He says, this is Jesus speaking again. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. So what the Spirit of God we give us is something that is of God. It's from him specifically. If you jump down to verse 17 there, it says, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So is it from God? If it's from God, it's going to align with his word. Now, in contrary to that, something that we saw previously in 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 4, look at what he said previously. He says, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments or his word is a liar and the truth is not in him. So in contrast, if you're hearing something that's telling you to do something that is not in harmony with God's word or his commandments, that's not truth, as we just read in John 17, verse 17. That's of another spirit. Well, the second aspect of this, or the second test for knowing whether it's from God or not, does what you're hearing contain fear? And when I talk about fear, I'm not talking about the fear of God, that's a different subject. I'm talking about the fear that we'll look at a little bit later in our study tonight, the fear of torment. So does what you're hearing, does it contain fear or does it make you fearful? If it does, it's not of the Lord. A couple of scriptures clearly tell us this. If we look at 2 Timothy, you turn over there with me. This is a common one. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. If something's making you anxious or fearful, it's doubtful that it would be from God. Another passage specifically from 1 John that we've already looked at we'll look at a little bit later, sorry. From 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. Look what he says here. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Fear is the opposite of love. So again, that second test or another test of whether or not this is the Lord speaking to us or someone else, does it contain fear? Well, the third one, does it contain peace? Does it contain peace? That's very similar to kind of what we just looked at, but from John chapter 14. Look what he says here in verse 27. Again, this is Jesus speaking. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. That's what the Lord gives us. He gives us peace. Now, what's interesting there is where he says this. If you look at the verse prior to that, verse 23, it's in the context of the Holy Spirit and the gift of the Holy Spirit to us. The last thing, and this is not an exhaustive list of how we know it's from God. These are just some of the things to go along with what we looked at here in verse 2. But the fourth thing is, does what we're hearing draw us closer to God or away from God? we got a couple clear passages that tell us, like James 4, 8, for example, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Is what we're hearing, or we believe that we're hearing, is it drawing us closer to God or away from God? That is a real quick test of whether or not it's from God. Now, in contrast, if you're still here in the book of John, 
Turn over to John chapter 10, verse 10. Look at what the other team's mission is or how they operate. John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. Again, Jesus speaking here, I have come that I, or they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So again, we see that if it's of another spirit, it's not going to be drawing us closer to God because that's not what the other team's agenda is as we've already looked at. So that are a couple things that we can know when we're hearing or when we have a leaning. This is another aspect of what it means to test the spirits. One, does it confess that Jesus is the Son of God and came in the flesh? Does it align with God's word? Does it contain fear? If it contains fear, it's not of God. Does it bring peace? And does it draw us closer to God? So back to 1 John, as we're continuing here, as to what it means to test the spirits. Verse 3, he continues, and he says, And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has came in the flesh or come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. So in other words, the inverse of what we just saw in verse 2, well, that is true as well. That if it doesn't confess that Jesus came in the flesh and is the Son of God, well, then that is the spirit of the Antichrist. Now, we get a little information here. Specifically, John tells us, well, that you have heard was coming. This wasn't new news to them specifically. Shouldn't be new news to us as well. We've already seen that referenced earlier in the chapter, but Jesus explained very clearly that this was what was going to happen. This is the deception that is to come. Now, he says specifically here that it is already in the world. Not necessarily because we know at the time that that wasn't the case, right? The Antichrist that is talked about is not on the scene at that time. But specifically, the spirit of the Antichrist, or that that is opposed to the truth and the truth of God. That's what he's talking about here. That there are deceivers out there that are working to deceive you with a false doctrine. Well, not so with us, though. Well, why? Why do we say that? Because he tells us here in verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Look at what he says, what he tells us. This is a promise of God for the believer. We talked about this in the last chapter two or two chapters ago, but he says, we are of God. His spirit dwells within us, and in addition to that, that in itself is enough, but he says he who is in you as a believer is greater than he who is in the world. Now what John is reminding us of here is a function of what Christ accomplished on the cross and the very nature of his power. This is something that we, the brothers and I were talking about this outside before study tonight. This is something we need to constantly be reminded of as it really puts our problems and our situations in context, right? He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So in other words, what you have inside you, the Spirit of God inside you, the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, is greater than anything that the world could throw at you. It's greater than he who is in the world. That's helpful to remember, no matter what situation you're going through. We've got a lot of people going through a lot of difficult situations. A lot of us are going through difficult situations. But take courage, little children, as he tells us. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Now, 
we see a couple other things here. And I want to look at the reason why. So if you still have that marker in the book of John, turn back to John chapter 16. This is where we were previously, but let's pick it up a little bit later. Where he explains why this is true for us. So we'll pick it up here in John chapter 16, verse 25. This is again Jesus speaking, and we're going to see the amazing parallels to what we're looking at here in 1 John. But these things I have spoken to you in figurative language. But the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language. But I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask me in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. So think about that in the context of what we're looking at right now in the book of John and about the love and his love for us being in us. And because you have loved me, Jesus says, and have believed that I came forth from God. Well, he's referencing that very thing about testing the spirits, right? About how do you know? Well, by believing or that spirit testifying that Jesus came in the flesh. That's what he's saying here. Look what he says in verse 28. He said, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. There's no dispute about the incarnation of Jesus. We read it right here. Jesus himself said, I came forth from the Father. Speaking of God himself, have come into the world, and again, I leave the world and go to the Father. He came in the flesh, if there was any doubt. He says, verse 29, his disciples said to him, see, now you're speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this, we believe that you came forth from God. Verse 31, Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, has now come. You will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because my Father is with me. Verse 33, why we're here specifically. He says, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That's why John can confidently write to us that he who is in us is greater than he has who is in the world because Jesus Christ has overcome the world. That's what Jesus himself said. Well, if you turn back to John or 1 John here, Verse 5, now John is going to switch back to talking about the other team. He says, they are of the world. Speaking of the Antichrist, therefore they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. So here, John is telling us that, well, they're of the world. They're doing what the world thinks best and what the world knows how to do. And do we ever see that so clearly now in what's going on in our society? The world's doing what the world knows how to do. We see things like disorder. We see things like fear, confusion, selfishness, me-centeredness. All of that is the opposite of the Lord. It's not built on truth. It's built on their own understanding. That's how the world works. And as we read here in verse 5, they're of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world. And the world hears them. The, word, the world responds to them because that's what the world knows how to do. But look at verse 6. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. Look at what he says next. 
By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So there we clearly see the two teams being laid out. Well, there's the spirit of truth and there's the opposite, the spirit of error. But we don't have to have that. We don't have to be influenced by the spirit of error because we are of God is how he's, or what he's telling us. So the question we have to ask ourselves, well, okay, we understand that, John. How does that work? How does this work for us? Well, Paul really explains and lays this out pretty clearly for us. We'll look at this quickly. If you turn over to 2 Corinthians, we were actually just talking about this the other day and looked at some of the aspects of this. It might have been on Friday evening. But look at what he says here specifically. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we'll pick it up here in verse 1. It would be helpful if I was in 1 Corinthians, not 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we'll pick it up here in verse 1 again. And I, this is Paul speaking to the church at Corinth, I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's what Paul's ministry was about specifically, based on that in-person aspect of what he knew was true, that Jesus Christ came in the flesh and that he was crucified. That's what he determined to know, nothing except that. Verse 3, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's where he's saying it's based on, not in the way the world is doing things or the world's understanding, as John was just talking about, but specifically in the power of God for the Christian. Verse 6, he says, however, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age or the world, nor of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. That's what the other teams got. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Now, here's how this works, and this is why we're here specifically. You guys should know this pretty well. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. How does it work? His spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man? which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches another role of the Holy Spirit, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual or judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? Key verse, but we have the mind of Christ. That's how the mechanics of this work. So if you would, turn back to 1 John. So verse 6 again, we are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. Why? Because of what we just read in 1 Corinthians that Paul was explaining. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Verse 7. 
Now what we're going to see is John's going to pick up where he left off or pick back up where he left off in verse 23 of chapter 3. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for God is love, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So here, John is reminding us and building on where he left off in verse 23 of the importance and the command to love one another. Now, as we go forward and read a little bit more of this, you're going to see that there's such a strong parallel to the book, again, of John. Specifically, look at the, we all know, or we should all know, John 3.16, right? It's probably one of the first verses that a lot of us learned. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, right? That's what John 3.16 says. Look at what he's going to say here in the next couple of verses. It's right here. Just worded slightly different. This is what God did for us and the opportunity that everybody has. So picking it up again in verse 8, he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. What is love? Love is God. God is love. That's what he is. It's one of the descriptors of God. Verse 9, in this, the love of God was manifested towards us. In other words, in this, what he's going to say, the love of God was made known. That's what it means to manifest towards us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world. Doesn't that sound like what we just heard in John 3.16? That we might live through him. That's what he did for us as believers. That's what he did for the entire world. They just don't choose to accept it. Verse 10, in this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In other words, again, very similar to what we read in John 3.16, that this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to be a covering or an offering, a payment for our sins. That's exactly what we read in John 3.16. Well, what is our response to that? Well, he's going to explain this to us. Specifically, in the context of love. In other words, as we're going to read, we're to love like he loves. So look at this in verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, which is absolutely true, we also ought to love one another. That's what he tells us. That's our response to what he did for us by sending his only son. That if he loved us, in such a way that we also ought to love one another in such a way. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we think about that, and we think about that, in, in, he's writing to the believers. We've already established that. Loving in context of other believers is what's specifically being said, but it goes beyond that, right? It's not just about loving your brother and sister in Christ. It applies to loving everyone because God so loved everyone as well. So what about that guy that just took the last parking space at Costco? Or what about those people that are wearing, making us wear those masks? And you know how we don't really like that, right? Yeah, it's about loving that person too. What about loving that person that, you know, got voted into the, as a new president, yes, that person too. We're to love like he loves. Well, why? Well, he's going to tell us here in verse 12 specifically why. Well, verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. Well, why are we to love one another? 
Well, simply put, well, this is how we manifest God or make God known to others who, if we think about God, you can't see God in the physical sense, right? You can see things that he's doing. You can see him in nature and different things like that. But in the physical sense, like I can see each of you, we don't see God necessarily that way. But one of the ways we can see him is by how we manifest or make known him through our love for other people, because that's what he did. That's what this is saying. By the gift he gave of his son, if we love or when we love like that, to that person that took that last parking space, we're manifesting the character of God to others. Think about that. That's one of the ways that we make him known. Now, we see another aspect in this verse. If we love one another, God abides in us. So when we're loving, in other words, what that means is that when, when we're loving, which is an attribute of God, we're in the Spirit, He abides in us, as we've said previously. And His love has been perfected in us. Well, what does He mean by that? Well, this idea of being perfected or made complete in us, the fullness is experienced the way the Lord intended it to be. Well, why? Because we're abiding in him. That's what it says. When we love one another, we're abiding in him. Therefore, the fullness of what the Lord's love looks like is in us because we're in the spirit specifically. Well, how do we know this and that he abides in us? Well, look what he says to us in verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us. It's because of our good works, right? No, not at all what it says. Here you go again, because he has given us his spirit. This is the second time in tonight's study, specifically, that he's told us the way this works. Not because of our own efforts, but because he has given us his spirit. That's how we know. It's by his spirit working in us. Now, there's a, 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 a similar passage, if you want to turn over to the left here, to Romans chapter 8. Just looked at this not too long ago in our Roman study. Romans chapter 8. Look what he says in, let's pick this up in verse 12, instead of jumping right to it. Romans chapter 8, verse 12, he says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Right there is a life verse for us. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. In other words, he's just explaining the two natures. There's the nature of the flesh and there's the nature of the Spirit. Spirit brings life. The flesh brings death. Verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. That's how this works. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. That's not the spirit we were given. This is another verse talking about the fear aspect of it and how that's not what you were given. But you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. It goes to explain a little bit of some of the other roles of the Holy Spirit here, but he says the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. That's the spirit he's given us. So how does this work? Well, it works by his spirit in us. So back to First John. Verse 14, he continues. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Now, we got to think about this from John's perspective. John witnessed Jesus in the flesh. We saw that very clearly back in the first chapter of this particular study, where he said, he said, 
verse 1 of chapter 1 of 1 John, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, he saw it, with, or he heard it with his own ears, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. John was an eyewitness testimony of the Father, or of the Son, the Father through the Son, and testified to the fact that he was the Savior of the world. That's what he says in verse 14 there. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as the Savior of the world. Well, verse 15, he continues, he says, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So very similar to what Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that we've looked at um, specifically a couple times now in our Friday night grace study, where he says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart, well, ultimately you will be saved. This is another similar verse to that. He says here, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we've seen many aspects of what it means to abide in God. And these are aspects of that or things that we see flowing out of that. Now, this idea of confessing, I think we need to kind of think about that in a careful way. This isn't just simply with words. This is, simple, this is more that in practice, that you're confessing it. Not, you know, the demons knew of Jesus, right? That's not what this means to confess. Oh, yeah, I know Jesus. We got specific verses about that too, right? No, this is in practice, that your practice, your life aligns with what his word says, with him being Lord and Savior. That's what he's referring to here. So whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. Verse 16, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. Second time we've seen that this evening. And he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. This is where John is really tying all of what we've looked at thus far this evening. He's tying it together, right? He's saying, well, hey, this is how the abiding thing works. And if you want to abide, we need to abide in love. Why? Because God is love. And therefore, by abiding in love, you are in God. As he said, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Well, verse 17, he continues, he says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so we are in this world. Well, here he's saying that there's another aspect of love. Well, it offers boldness in the day of judgment. Now, look back to what he said in chapter 2, verse 28. This idea of boldness in the day of judgment, he said in verse 28, he said, Now, little children, abide in him. There you have it again. That when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. So here we see a connection between his appearing and his return and being confident or having boldness. Why? Because we're abiding in him, specifically in love. Well, we're seeing a similar concept to what we just read back in verse 28, as we just read. Now, there's this also this aspect here where he says, in a day of judgment, speaking specifically of a future time, that when that happens, and we know that we're all going to stand and give an account, we've talked about that in a couple of recent studies too, that we can have confidence in that day because the power of his love working in us. This is based on what we just read in verse 16 and how abiding is bound up in love, in loving him. So why is that the case or how so? Well, he gave us that in the latter part of verse 17, because as he is, so, we, so are we in this world. In other words, when we're abiding and his love is perfected in us, or made complete in us, our condition, 
the here and now aspect of our relationship with him, well, it matches our position. And think about that for a minute. When we say position where he is seated and what Christ is, when, that's what happens when we are abiding in him. So why or how is this? Because when we're like him, that flows out of us in our relationship to the world. As he said here, because as he is, so are we in this world. Now, verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. So now he's bringing in another aspect of this. And we looked at this verse earlier when we were referencing how we, when we're hearing something, whether we know it's of God or not. Well, he says specifically here to us in verse 18 that there's no fear in love. Actually, in love, or love is the absence of fear. Now, as I had already mentioned, but it's helpful to remind ourselves here, we're not talking about a reverential fear of God. That's not what we're referring to here. As he says here, we're talking about the fear of torment. The fear of torment is the absence of love. And then the inverse is true, that love is the absence of the fear of torment. Well, he keys in on another aspect here, too. He says, it's not just love that he's referring to. He says, but perfect love casts out fear. Well, what does he mean by perfect love? Well, it really ties back to what he said in verse 8 of this particular chapter in verse 16. Back in verse 8, he says, who does not love? It's not no God, for God is love. And then in verse 16, he also said that God is love. That's what perfect love looks like. It's love that looks like God. It's love like God loved us. And that's where he's tying back into what we read in John 3, 16, or we read specifically in what he did in verse 9 and 10 of this particular chapter as well. That's what perfect love looks like. In other words, a love like God. So if you are fearful or afraid, you're not abiding in his perfect love. Let me say that again. If you are fearful or afraid, as we've just read, you're not abiding in his perfect love because his love is the absence of fear. Well, verse 19, and where we're going to hold up for this evening, he says, we love him because he first loved us. That's how it works. That's how we know what love looks like because of what he did for us first. This is key, much like we saw with keeping his commandments. It's not something we can do. The reason we can love or we have that ability to love, which is really him working through us or his spirit working through us, is not because of our own efforts. It's because he first loved us. What an amazing verse. Now, we're going to hold up here, as I said, but before we hold up here, I want to look back at one more thing and close with the words of Jesus in the book of John. We turn with me one last time to the book of John this evening, John chapter 17. This is where we're going to close. John chapter 17, verse 20. This is that beautiful prayer that Jesus prays not only for his disciples, but for believers everywhere. I'm going to close with this this evening. John chapter 17, verse 20. This is the words of Jesus again. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you that they also may be one with us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Look at that intimate relationship in the prayer between Jesus and the Father. 
he continues, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. That's what he wants for us. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. Look at this. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. That's his prayer for us and for all believers is that the love that he has with the Father, that intimate love between the two of them would also be in us. That was Jesus' prayer for us. That's what we can experience and have in him. Let's close with prayer. Father, we do just come to you again, Father. I don't know what else to say other than to thank you for all that you have done for us, Father. For As your word says, we can love because you loved us first. That's who you are. You are love, as we've looked at so clearly. Father, and the only way any of this can be true for us is because of your spirit working in us. What an amazing gift as your son promised us, as we read of in the book of John. What an amazing gift you have provided for us. Father, my prayer for each of us is that we would heed your words this evening, Lord. We heard very clearly We've heard it over and over again in this particular study of what it means to abide in you and what that looks like. And one of the aspects is that we would love one another. Father, that's what it looks like when we're abiding in you. We were also reminded so clearly, Lord, that there is another team out there and that they are working very diligently and very hard to deceive us. Father, but that doesn't have to be so, as your word says. Because we have a different spirit working within us. And you have told us how we know that it's you speaking to us versus the other team speaking to us. Father, my prayer is simply that we hear your voice. Your word says that your sheep hear you and know your voice. Father, that's my prayer for each of us this evening. I do ask, Lord, as we continue and come close to wrapping up this book next week, Father, that you would guide us and lead us into your truth and everything you would want us to know. It's through your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.